Hello everybody, uh, my name's Bernard Dobe, I'm a scientist and I've worked on uh, dung beetles and parasites uh, and sustainable agriculture for the last 40-45 years. Initially with the university, then with CSIRO for nearly 30 years and in recent times uh, we, I have run my own research and development business. So I uh, know an awful lot about the sorts of things that I'm going to talk about today. Um, what I'll be talking about is the uh, way in which to manage your horses and your horse property so as to um, preserve the uh, chemicals that you use for chemical control of your parasites and to improve the sustainability of your system. I'll be talking about natural control of gut worms and about dung beetles in, that bury them. So that's the two primary uh, focuses, although there are other things that I'll mention. Um, the main theme of what I'm going to talk about is we want to reduce our reliance on chemicals but still use them, they're very important, and increase our reliance on natural processes. And so the natural processes that I'll be talking about is natural immunity to parasites in the horses, biological control of pasture pests to a very small extent, and uh, dung beetles for biological control of your um, gut parasites and uh, for improving your pastures and getting rid of the horse dung from your pastures. This will have numerous benefits. Firstly, it will save you a lot of money in chemicals because I'll be suggesting that you don't need to treat as frequently as you have possibly in the past and that you don't need to treat all of your animals. So you you have substantially reduced uh, chemical uh, usage which w will reduce the poisoning of the environment, you'll have natural control of your pests and diseases and increased biodiversity. Now of course um, 50, 60 years ago pre-war agriculture worked perfectly well and um, relied upon uh, domestic stock, horses, cattle, sheep and we didn't have the plethora of um, ag agricultural veterinary chemicals that we have today. So um, after the turn of the war, a huge uh, scientific investigation produced antibiotics for control of bacterial diseases, vaccines of course for viral diseases, chemicals to control gut parasites of which you will, you will all be very well aware chemicals to control lice and other pests, and chemicals for pasture pests. So all of these things are relatively new things and <clears throat> they, are, they have been used to excess and um, they are doing a lot of damage. But they are nevertheless very beneficial organisms. So Julian Cribb, professor in Sydney, wrote a book very recently called Poison Planet. Um, and how um, man-made chemicals are putting us at risk. And he said, each day we are assailed by thousands of different man-made chemicals and the World Health Organization estimates that 80% of all cancers could be attributed to human interactions with chemicals, radiation and tobacco smoke. So this is clearly, we're, I think we're all aware that many of these uh, chemicals that are um, being foisted upon us by the uh, industrial uh, arrangements that uh, sell them, um, uh, that these are uh, damaging to us, but uh, um, what can we do about it? Well, I suggest that we should reduce our use of chemicals in all sorts of different ways. Um, uh, an insight into this can be ca gained by looking at um, some situations. For instance, not all horses have uh, worms. We all know that local ponies around the place sitting in a, in a paddock on their own are commonly uh, not wormed at all and yet they're in, in fine fettle. Well, this is an example of a place in the Adelaide Hills called the Oakwood Equestrian Centre uh, where they run 12 horses and they haven't used drenches or paste for the last seven years. They do use a few dietary supplements, the Colby diet, and they have very, very healthy horses. So no drenches for seven years and yet the horses in a commercial situation are very healthy. So um, that is um, a very important lesson I think for us all. So we can also ask what else apart from um, reducing the chemical usage, what other factors are important? Well. Um, 
in the last 60 or so years, we have transferred our faith from uh, natural processes to um, chemical processes produced by the industrial um, industrial companies that uh, govern our lives, really. But and the missing or underrated factors in in that in the current way we view things is that natural immunity to parasites is is commonly uh, ignored. Biological control of pasture pests is only used minimally. Biological control of gut worms by uh, dung beetles and, and other other factors uh, are not used very much or used to, to some extent, but uh, underutilized. Pasture rotations, resistance to and the resist the, the danger of the development of resistance to chemicals in pests. Sorry, danger of resist developing resistance to pests. Danger of developing resistance to chemicals in the pests that are in our agricultural system. So uh, these pests are becoming resistant, and the chemicals we use are no longer as effective as they were. And the last un seriously underrated factor is the role of dung beetles. So I'm now going to talk briefly about the life cycle of gut worms. Um, there's a, there's a great plethora of, of different types of gut worm, but they all have basically the same cycle. They leave the horse as an egg in the dung, and they hatch into the la hatch into larvae. Those eggs, the larvae, hatch in a few days in summer and many days in winter. Then the larvae, this is something that's commonly not really well appreciated, that the larvae <coughs> that have hatched out of the egg uh, feed upon the dung juices and then molt into a second stage larva, which also feeds upon dung juices, which then molts into a third instar larva, which then only then is it the uh, becomes the infective stage, leaves the dung pad and crawls up a grass stem where it can be eaten by the horse. So, um, in uh, the the larval stages can take five to seven days in summer and many weeks in winter. So what this means is that the um, the time uh, before uh, which the larvae leave the dung pad and crawl up the dung the grass stems can be one week or so in summer, but many weeks in winter. And this has important implications for a whole series of things. So in summer, we're looking at a few weeks. Uh, before the uh, larvae leave a week or so before the week or so before the larvae leave the dung, and um, in winter many weeks. So um, the first thing about to say, I suppose, is that horses kept in stables don't get gut worms because they they that the gut worms are denied that natural cycle. You know, you even if you leave the gut leave the dung in the stable, which rarely happens, um, the the horses are not eating the grass, not eating grass from paddocks, and so there's nowhere for the larvae to go. So the uh, the larvae die there. So why treat your horses when they're in stables? I don't think you should. Um, so now we know that dung beetle activity kills uh, kills uh, the infective stages of the worms and the eggs in the pasture. So they kill the worms through uh, drying out the dung pad. They also kill the worms by burying the dung. So this is this this picture shows a Australia with um, bubis bison, a winter active dung beetle on it, and there this is um, a week later. Maybe it's a fortnight later, but at any rate, there's the uh, massive dung burial, and what this does is dry out the surface dung and remove the uh, infective stages underground where they die. So I ask, are chemicals really necessary? Well, the answer is yes, of course, uh, but only in very in restricted situations, and um, only in restricted situations, and probably uh, only on a small proportion of your stock. So um, the worst types of gut worm around at the moment are the small blood worms. The large blood worms used to be uh, important, but since the widespread use of chemicals, they have become rather scarce. So the small blood worms are your 
uh, are likely to be your primary problem, although uh, numerous other um, types of parasite, of gut worms, uh, can also be present. So how do we control our, our gut parasites? Well, firstly, we use drenches or pastes. We can use natural immunity to the parasites. We can use pasture spelling, um, dung beetles, or we can use cross-grazing. Now, I'd just like to talk a little bit now about natural immunity. Um, horses and their parasites have had millennia of coevolution, and so what we have is a situation now where um, there, there is a, a natural balance between the parasite and the horse in a, a natural environment. So um, the gut worm inside the horse stimulates immunity, immunity to the worm, and um, so you get um, control, natural control of the worms in the gut, uh, so they don't grow well and many of them perish. This does little or no, the presence of these small numbers of worms does little or no damage to the, to the horse, but the low parasite numbers are really important because they stimulate the development of resistance to the parasite. So that's immunological resistance to the parasite in the same way as we've got immunological resistance to the common cold or other, other pests. However, if you use chemicals, for instance, and wipe out your parasites, then the natural uh, immunity will wane and so the, uh, resist so the horse will no longer be resistant to um, the no longer be resistant to the uh, parasite, and so you will have a, a serious uh, parasite infection, and so you you get back onto the treadmill of being dependent upon chemicals. Of course, there are exceptions. Foals and sick and old horses commonly have low levels of natural immunity, and so with them at least you need to control. Um, control your parasites with, with chemicals. Um, another factor which needs to be consideration, needs consideration, is that in the small blood worms there are cysts, uh, they, they, they sometimes form cysts in the gut wall. So they do that in spring and then they stay in the gut wall as cysts, not producing eggs, until autumn and then they are released in autumn. And so you get a massive burst of um, of um, small blood worms in autumn uh, as a consequence of the, uh, the um, parasites leaving the cysts in the gut wall. This has got important implications for chemical control, pasture smelling and for the role of dung beetles and also for the um, usefulness of um, fecal egg counts as a way of, con of assessing whether or not you you need to treat for your gut worms. I suppose another point that we should mention is that when they are insisted in the gut, they are largely resistant to many chemicals, although the, uh, the moxidectin, the chemical that is in uh, Equest, uh, seems to be relatively effective in, in killing them, killing the cysts in the gut wall, but most of the chemicals that are available don't do that. So. Here is a picture of uh, what it's like in some pastures in summer with, with dung spread all over the place. Now, this is in the absence of effective dung beetle activity, of course. So, um, when we're looking at um, managing our horses, we say, well, you know, should we treat them all or should we just treat some? Well, I believe that we should just treat some. And uh, in order to identify those that which we um, which we should treat, we can use faecal egg counts. Now these these are not uh, 100%, as I explained earlier. You know, with the insisted uh, small blood worms, the the cysts uh, keep the the parasite inside the cyst does not produce eggs, and so the um, the horse can have a great load of uh, insisted parasites and yet there will be very few eggs in the faeces. But putting that aside, uh, faecal egg counts in spring, in spring, autumn and winter are, are, a, are, a good, um, are a good way of assessing them. You can also look at the coat and general condition and um, 
Of course it's true that some animals in good condition still have high uh, worm burdens and some animals in poor condition don't have serious worm burdens but you can always be assured that animals in, uh, most animals in poor condition have got worm, have got serious worm problems. So of course the foals and the sick and the old need to be, uh, they, they are, um, have low levels of natural immunity and um, so they need to be treated. So if you just identify those uh, animals, those, uh, those few animals in your herd, your mob of cat horses um, and on, treat only them and treat them only when they've got high egg counts, then you will reduce the cost of the chemicals substantially and you'll also slow the development of resistance to the chemicals and I'll deal with that in just a minute. So for long-term sustainability um, we need high quality food, water, shelter and exercise for your horse of course but we need to control the parasites and pathogens. pathogens. Uh, we need to manage the development of chemical resistance. We need to either slow or stop it and I'll deal with how we might do that in a minute. We need to manage your pastures and manage your dung beetles. So um, I will just deal briefly now um, with, with dung beetles. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to just spend a little more time talking about um, identifying and treating the, um, the shedders in, in a herd, in a mob of, of, of horses. Uh, only a small proportion of the horses in, in a mob of horses uh, will have heavy worm burdens and the rest of them will be under natural control. So in in natural, uh, under natural control, um, the presence of low numbers of, of worms stimulates resistance. So if you identify and tr chemically treat just the shedders, then what you will be doing is eliminating most of the worms from your pasture. Uh, but you'll be doing something else which is possibly much more important in the long term. Uh, because you will be only treating a small portion of the population and the, the, and the worms which remain in the majority of the horses will still be susceptible to the chemicals. So you will have a reservoir of susceptible worms which will be providing the uh, inocula to the pastures. So the, the shedders and your, your um, ordinary horses, the rest of the mob, will be picking up primarily uh, susceptible worms. And so this is a way of retaining uh, the susceptibility uh, in the worm population to the available chemicals. In other words, you are preserving the chemicals for future generations. So I think that identifying and treating your shedders uh, and only treating them, and only treating them when they have, have high worm numbers, for instance, isn't, you know, if, if, the, if they have small uh, red worms and all of those red worms are insisted during summer then there's not much point in treating them with most chemicals because you won't even get the red worms uh, so you wait until autumn and then check your um, fecal egg counts and then treat them. So, um, so here we have, now I'm going to talk um, for the rest of the talk about dung beetles and then just summarise things at the end. So uh, dung beetles are important around the world. Um, in South Africa, for instance, they are even a protected species. Numbers of them are protected species. This is an elephant. This is an elephant uh, uh, dung beetle in Addo Elephant Park, a wingless dung beetle. Most most beetles have wings, so they fly from dung pad to dung pad. Um, but here in Australia, this is up in the Eden Valley with the. Phil and Sarah Lehman. Uh, this is a, a dung beetle that we've uh, introduced uh, from southern Europe called Copris hispanus, a beautiful dung beetle. Um, and in fact CSIRO have introduced now 23 species, of introduced and established 23 species, uh, many of which occur in southern Australia. So you can manage them on your property. Um, in southern Australia we have summer species, 
um, th three or four or five, depending upon where you are. We have a, a went one winter species called Bubis bison, which is a fantastic beetle. And we, there are uh, small numbers of autumn and spring beetles, but uh, they are largely, uh, there are a couple of native species which are auto, uh, active then, and um, we are currently br bringing in um, two extra spring species. So these are really important because uh, the spring species that we have at the moment show very low levels of activity and so the dung is hardly buried at all during spring. Um, the other thing we need to consider uh, is um, toxic chemicals, toxic chemicals on pastures and toxic chemicals in pastes and drenches. On the pastures, the chemicals that you might use to control the red-legged earth mite, for instance, um, uh, most of those are, are highly toxic to dung beetles. So um, you need to at least uh, adhere to the withholding periods before you graze your your horses in on pastures where you treat with, um, say, the red-legged earth mite with, um, with chemicals. But um, it's also important to appreciate that the red-legged earth mite in many situations is under effective biological control. But if you use toxic chemicals, then you not only wipe out the red-legged earth mite, but you wipe out their natural enemies. And then the, the um, Red-legged earth mite breeds up much more quickly than its natural enemies, and so you've got a, a, a pasture pest uh, where you wouldn't have had one had you left things alone. So my recommendation is, except in extreme situations, uh, to be very careful of using chemicals for controlling pasture pests. The other matter is toxic chemicals uh, in drenches and pastes. There are a series of chemicals which make the dung toxic to dung beetles. There's one called moxidectin, which is a dung beetle amongst the mectins, the group of mectins like ivermectin, um, doramectin, those sorts of things. There's one called moxidectin, which is um, beetle friendly. So you can use moxidectin without killing your dung beetles. But if you use the others, you will, you can, you'll damage your dung beetle populations very severely. In fact, if you treat a horse today with, say, a toxic chemical such as ivermectin, the dung produced tomorrow is very, will be toxic to the dung beetles, and the dung produced in three or four weeks' time will also be toxic to the dung beetles. So you can do very serious damage to your dung beetle populations by using such chemicals. So what do the dung beetles do? Well, um, they bury dung, of course. Um, and for every uh, litre of dung they bury, they bring a, a litre of subsoil to the surface. Um, this is a picture of the soil brought to the surface by a, a dung beetle in Western Australia in a, um, in a nice pasture. And you see when, it, when it's stretched out, it's, uh, it's quite long. And that is, the, that is the depth to which this dung beetle, Bubis bison, buries its dung. So down at about 40 to 60 centimetres in, in this case. So Bubis bison is a deep tunnelling beetle and puts the dung well away from the surface. And so um, that is one of the reasons why it, it is highly effective in controlling your gut worms. So here's another picture of the um, dung beetles on Kangaroo Island this time. Um, this is, uh, again, um, there's about half a dozen dung beetles in that pile of cattle dung on this occasion, and uh, they will completely bury it over the next week. Underneath you can see the tunnels down which the, the tiny tunnels really in relation to how much dung they bury, but at any rate that uh, dozen or whatever it is, uh, tunnels, uh, each with one pair of dung beetles working in it, uh, will bury the entire pad in about 10 days and uh, so effectively control your um, gut worms amongst other uh, great benefits. So CSIRO has introduced two bull rollers and 21 tunnelers to Australia. Um, these, there is one of them, again with Sarah, um, and um, but we need to introduce more dung beetle species, and we are currently uh, we've currently got two in mass rearing facilities in South Australia, two uh, winter act two spring active beetles from southern Europe, uh, 
and we are planning to bring in additional species to Australia. So, overall, the benefits of integrated parasite management, such as I've been talking about, the benefits of it are that you can, you can have healthy horses and yet use few chemicals with strategic use of chemicals, um, treating not all of your animals but only some of them and identifying those that need to be treated um, with uh, faecal egg counts. You can have healthy horses and low chemical use which will provide uh, substantial savings to you. There will be natural control of your parasites because of the uh, stimulated immunity to the parasites and the rest of your herd. You will have reduced cost of chemicals as I've already said and that will substantially slow or even stop the development of resistance. Further, you won't be poisoning the environment and uh, in addition you will have dung beetles improving your pasture. Uh, and improving water quality and a whole lot of other things. So overall, this new strategy in which we uh, emphasise biological processes and um, just use uh, chemicals in a restricted and strategic way uh, is the way forward in my view. So there is a whole lot of more, new, more information about this and a new beetle, new book on dung beetles that has just been, that I've just written. Um, uh, it came out last year, so there it is. And um, in addition to that, there's a whole, there's this new fact sheets. Uh, there's a new website that you can you can go and inspect and uh, get a lot of this information. And so there were eight fact sheets produced. You can see you can download any of those that you wish and print them for your own information. Um, and these have only just been uh, released. So um, uh, last last weekend. Um, in the second or third weekend of March 19, uh, 2015, uh, Jane Myers, a, a well-known horse person, um, came and uh, we joined forces and launched the uh, fact sheets and here are some pictures of them. Um, and that is the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.